welcome. Thank you all so much for joining our Intro to Melt webinar today. My name is Carrie Bodendorf and I am a Melt Master Trainer. I've been with Melt for almost a dozen years and it has changed my life. I am so excited to introduce you to Sue Hitzman, who is our founder. She is the creator and she is a New York Times bestselling author of The Melt Method. She's going to talk to us about why fascia or connective tissue is so important and how melt can help you lead a more active pain-free life. After Sue's short presentation, she will turn it over to you all. So what questions do you have? We're gonna be bringing these questions to Sue so she can answer you live. If you have any questions about products or orders that you've recently placed, please, instead of posting them here, email instructor, I'm sorry, in, info at meltmethod.com, or you can go right to the Melt Method website and chat with one of our live um, people that, that work for us. Uh, and they're standing by ready to answer all of your questions. So buckle in everybody and we're going to welcome Sue and take it away, Sue. Hey everybody, welcome to the webinar today. I'm Sue Hitzman, creator of The Melt Method. Thanks for taking interest in our online instructor training. And today what I hope to do is give you insight on why fascia is important beyond muscles. So today we're gonna learn why fascia matters uh, on every aspect of your body, not just about releasing muscles, but how it matters in your health and well-being. And of course, if your goal is to live a vibrant life with less aches and pains and more vitality, I really want you to understand the role that fascia plays in every aspect of your health so that you can achieve that goal. Now in the therapeutic and fitness industries, it's widely understood that fascia supports our musculoskeletal system and gives your joint shock absorption, and it is what keeps your muscles balanced and connected. Muscles and fascia are inseparable, scientifically called myofascia. The words myo means muscle, and of course fascia is connective tissue, so myofascia simply means fascia relating to muscle. So there's lots of myofascia release techniques out there, foam rolling, trigger point therapy, Theraguns, vibrating rollers, so many tools that claim to release fascia, but does fascia release? So today we're gonna to create a new language to help you better understand why fascia is so critical to understand to help you live a more vibrant and pain-free life. So first let's start with what is fascia? There's a lot of diverse names for the individual parts of the fascial system, uh, but it's all connected and constructed of the same molecular components. So you see this incredible list of words, connective tissue, fascia, fascias, perifascia, superficial fascia, uh, the, so that's the tissue right under your skin. The loose areolar connective tissue is also what it's sometimes termed as. Deep fascia, ligaments, tendons, cartilage, myofascia, or you're going microscopic, the extracellular matrix and the interstitium. All of these words all are based on the same molecular components. It's just, are you cutting it with a blade or are you looking through a microscope? And that's what's so compelling is how we're looking at connective tissue today. And in more recent times, fascia has vast definition. Uh, all of the collagenous soft tissue in the body is what they're defining it as. And that includes the cells that create and maintain the intricate microscopic network we define as the extracellular matrix. So really fascia could be considered a body-wide neuroelectrochemical superconducting transportation network. Say that 10 times fast. But the reason that I can say that is because the extracellular matrix is one of the most important regulators of cellular and tissue function in the body. Now because of the use of atomic force microscopy and confocal lasers, and of course the advances in science and technology, the dedicated researchers in this field have been able to uncover the important role fascia plays in every aspect of our health. And now that we understand fibroblasts and the cells that make all of the proteins and fluids defined as the extracellular matrix, we now understand fascia provides a seamless three-dimensional 
fluid-based tensional network, giving your entire body stability, connectivity, and integration. So fascia is a system of stability that supports all of your nerves, blood vessels, cells, and organs. So microscopically, fascia is a three-dimensional, fully integrated, cohesive environment that every other system, organ, and tissue relies upon to function efficiently. It's the internal environment every other system lives in, so it has to play an integral role in all other systems functions. So it helps us manage stress regulation, immune health, and it even plays a role in nutrient absorption and waste elimination. So really the fascial matrix has a relationship to cellular lifespan or aging. Uh, it also has a relationship with neural signaling or your overall function, your sensory motor control. And it also plays a role in electrochemical adaptation. So that means hormones and metabolism. Fascia is playing a role in all of these functions of our body. So really, fascia is the stability system of your body. And I really want you to hear me say that word system. It's not just a tissue. It is in fact a system. So the question is, how can we define it as a system? Well, we now have microscopic evidence that stability and motion aren't achieved through a biomechanical lever and pulley system. Rather, it's achieved through tension and compression management in a three-dimensional way. So it really doesn't matter how you're looking at fascia from the macro level of a tissue or the microscopic level of an extracellular matrix, you're gonna see the presence of a tissue dynamic that is entirely cohesive from head to toe, skin to bones. This non-linear fluid-based biological fabric is what allows motion to occur without losing stability when stress is applied. And the term that's being used now over the past decade is biotensegrity. And that's a word that is taken from the word tensegrity, which was developed by Buckminster Fuller and Kenneth Snelson, who created tensegrity architecture. These are structures that are managed by the continuous tensional elements that allow the design to disperse force throughout the entire structure. So unlike traditional compression models, like a basic building design, where you got one brick stacked atop another until you have continuous compression forces managing the structure, Tensegrity models possess discontinuous compression elements that are suspended within a continuous tension network like you see here. So our fascial system functions in relatively the same way. They define that as biotensegrity. So this type of tensional assembly they call polyhelidric shapes is found in all living matter. But in the human body, the only tissue that actually possesses this architectural form is the fascial system, but we see this in all living matter. And what I always love thinking of with fascia is think about it kind of like a spider's web, right? If a fly hit that spider's web, the vibration and the tolerance of that spider's web is gonna disperse the force throughout the entire web so that no one area completely crushes. But when you have an injury or a surgery, it's kind of like you got a cobweb living in your body, right? Because a scar is going to create it adhesion under the skin surface. So even if you have a scar and you think it heals perfectly, the underlying plane of fascia has remnants of a scar always. And we see that it, tissue presence in dissection time and again. In fact, people who have a gallbladder surgery might have a tiny surgical scar on the skin surface, but the underlying system has a great deal of scar tissue or adhesions that can penetrate clear through the visceral sac. So, Again, it's important that we learn more about fascia and how to improve the fluid flow of fascia. Uh, and that again is what MELT is all about. So really, bones uh, are managed by the tension created by the cohesive fascial matrix. Our skeleton does not manage our structure, posture, or stability. Bones are more like spacers, but the fascia is the continuous tension network that manages the discontinuous definable compression elements like your bones or your organs, right? So it's what's keeping your organs and your nerves and your blood vessels cushioned and supported and connected in a three-dimensional way. Now on a microscopic level, what's even more compelling is that cells are reactive to the environment that they live in. Cells need a solid mechanical environment to function in so that they can communicate with one another. So when it comes to what maintains our overall stability, we now know that the fascial system, again, 
is the stability system of our body. And listen, when I say stability, I'm not talking about how well you balance on a BOSU ball. Fascia plays a role not only in our structural stability, but our emotional, psychological, chemical, neurological, hormonal, and cellular stability because, again, fascia possesses an inherent connection with every other system, organ, nerve, and cell in your body, which is why they call it connective tissue. They're not calling it connective tissue for nothing. We could even call fascia a stress responsive system or a transportation highway for neural signaling. Fascia is a dynamic system that plays a significant role in joint stability, inflammation and wound repair, immune health, mental well-being, and neurological regulation. So again, I'm calling fascia a stability system of your entire body. So when we talk about instability, when fascia loses its supportive qualities, our ability to manage stress on all levels is compromised and unwanted compensation and adaptation can begin to occur without our awareness. And when I say stress, I mean stress of all levels. Right now, I'm stressed to your body, right? Living is stressful. You can't get away from stress. And in fact, stress is a good thing. It's what challenges our body to sustain efficiency. But in this day and age, our bodies are a bit stressed out. So we wanna understand a little bit more and I'm gonna talk about this as we go. But when it comes to fascia, it's not just the collagen matrix that makes fascia so supple and supportive. The interstitial fluids in fascia are what are playing a significant role in how we move as well. So if you think of the fluid in fascia like a river, Repetitive postures and movements of daily living can create sediment in the river that kind of alters our river's natural flow, causing excessive compression pull or friction on the tissue, and that can alter joint stability and mobility. I call this sediment stuck stress, and it loves to accumulate around our joints where fascia is extra durable and supportive. And that's really the issue for sensory motor control because your autonomic nervous system, what we call in MELT the autopilot, is actually relying on the sensory nerve fibers in our joints that convey information to the central nervous system about forces exerted at the joints in both low and high load movements. So whether you're doing yoga or you're doing HIIT training, Fascia and how your joints are relating to the central nervous system, how your brain is relaying that is really important. So think of it kind of like a GPS system, right? Your joints are sort of like satellites and your autopilot is trying to figure out where those joints are in relationship to gravity to manage the load of our movements. So if the autopilot can't quickly identify load to your low back or your knee satellites, if you will, that's how injury happens. It's also a key factor that causes repetitive stress injuries because the nervous system is designed to compensate to keep you moving. So if these sediment blockages, if you will, are kind of like roadblocks and the sensory motor pathways start to occur, you don't not move, your brain figures out a way around the roadblocks, kind of like how you would take a side street instead of a highway when there's traffic on the highway and you gotta get downtown, you start taking side streets to get there. It's not the most efficient route, but it gets you where you wanna go in relatively the same amount of time. Well, your nervous system kind of doing the same thing, but when your nervous system does it, you're actually sacrificing joint stability for efficiency until pain or injury slows you down. Now, another thing that, that's really why we always talk about in MELT, why we're so joint focused, right? People don't get hamstring replacements as they get older, right? They get hip and knee replacements and have joint surgeries due to a lack of fascial integrity. So muscle strains are often secondary to joint instability. And if you are constantly working with joints that are stiff and inflexible, and you have all this connective tissue blockages in your body, if you will, a lack of fluid perfusion around your joints, you're actually exhausting your nervous system when fascia isn't supportive. And listen, even those of you that are listening to me and you're, you say, hey, I don't have any pain problems at all, I'll guarantee you've experienced the pre-pain signals of stuck stress. For example, do you ever wake up in the morning and your body just feels really stiff when you first get out of bed? Or you sit down for a little bit of time and when you get up, you kind of feel like you aged 40 years because your joints don't work as well when you get up as they did when you sat down? Well, we've all experienced this, right? And most people don't think that's a problem because when you get up and you move around, what happens? 
the stiff and achiness kind of go away, right? But the reality of it is, although you, the feeling that you have goes away, the stiffness and the issue in connective tissue doesn't really go away. So if you're waking up kind of feeling as stiff as a dried out sponge left out overnight on your kitchen sink, that's kind of a problem because if you never really do anything about it to directly help restore the fluid flow of your fascia, you're gonna start getting symptoms that are quite a bit more noticeable. You'll start to notice that your joints in multiple regions start to really bother you. Your back or neck spaces start feeling compressed and inflexible. Your muscles start to ache you all the time and your posture declines. Because stuck stress, again, alters sensory motor control and it exhausts your neurological efficiency. Another good analogy of this is to understand the effects of stuck stress is if you kind of think of fascia like a sponge, when a sponge is hydrated, it can supportively move and adapt when you compress or pull on it, and it always returns to its ideal shape once the tension or compression is released, and it absorbs water really efficiently. But when a sponge is dehydrated, it's stiff and flexible. It doesn't adapt, react, or respond efficiently when you compress or pull on it. And it doesn't return to its ideal shape when you take the tension or compression away. And it can absorb water as well as a moist one. And unfortunately, drinking more water isn't the answer. You have to learn how to work the fluid back into the sponge through tension and compression. So beyond myofascial dysfunction and the muscle issues uh, causing immobility or structural instability, if fascia is chronically dehydrated on a cellular level, your cells don't absorb water or nutrient efficiently. Kind of how a dried out sponge doesn't absorb water as well as a moist one. And that's a much more critical problem than just your overall posture and alignment. When dehydration becomes chronic in fascia, it alters how your nervous system and your immune system on a cellular level manage stress because fascia is the environment these systems live in and rely upon to function efficiently. So as science puts it, within the human structure, there are subsystems that are seeking balance, homeostasis, and a state of stability. So simply instability can be defined as a loss of the functional integrity of a system which provides stability. And again, managing stability is actually the job of three primary systems. Your fascial system, the environment everything lives in, the autonomic nervous system, the system that's controlling 98% of what goes on for us in a normal day, and all of the involuntary mechanisms that function below the level of our conscious awareness because that's gonna to relate to our immune functions. And if our immune functions are suppressed and struggling to maintain balance, you can't think your way back into stability, right? For example, you, you can't think your way into absorbing nutrients or eliminating waste on a cellular level. Or if I asked you to sprint down a city block, but don't let your heart rate increase, you can't really think your way into doing that either. Even when you get super, super angry and you say to yourself, okay, calm down, Om Shanti myself, that might not actually calm you down at all. In fact, it actually might increase your frustration causing a prolonged stress response. So pain or discomfort is ultimately the body's way of letting you know it needs your help. It's kind of like a built-in alarm system alerting us that we need to tend to accumulative stress or the common day-to-day -day issues are likely going to become chronic. So if you think of it, the Benjamin Franklin quote, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, might have been referring to fire safety and not health, but if you think of your brain's pain response as a smoke detector going off when your toaster's on fire, it kind of makes sense. We often walk over to the smoke detector and pull the batteries out, but the toaster is still on fire. So what we want to do is learn how to fix the cause, not the symptom of pain. And then that way you get a recipe for a resilient life. So even if you do get injured or you have to have a surgery, your body is going to restore balance easier and with less effort and time. And here's another problem. Instability in general is sneaky. The autonomic and involuntary components which provide stability, especially autonomically, are designed to adapt and find ways to compensate to keep us functioning with some level of efficiency. And here's the bad news is we don't even know that that's happening. And if your compensation for stabilization starts to occur, stability on every level is going to decline. And especially when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, which is housed under the peripheral nervous system, the body's nervous system, there's three autonomic regulators housed under the autonomic nervous system that regulate stress, 
repair and digestion called the sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric nervous system. So ideally, your stress and repair processes are kind of ebbing and flowing through the day, right? Every time you have a stressful situation, ideally the repair process kind of comes back and levels you back out into what we call the easy zone. But really, in this day and age, we are inundated with stress. From morning till night, we are just loaded with too much stress. And so really, we're waiting until nighttime where cellular repair is dominant when we sleep to actually regain the balance. But what's happening with people's sleep these days, we're not really getting a very restful night's sleep. So if you don't get a restful night's sleep, cellular repair won't occur optimally and your immune responses over time can go haywire and become suppressed, which can ignite symptoms that seem completely unrelated to how you feel when you move. So you start noticing that you're gaining weight or you have trouble digesting food even though you haven't changed your diet, or you're constantly feeling bloated or constipated no matter what you eat. That starts to stress you out mentally and so that shades your emotional balance. Now you're feeling anxious or depressed most days. You have all this negative chatter in your mind and now you have midday fatigue and you start binge eating sugary foods to pep you up, right? You're seeing this, right? And what's worse is that as exhausted or wired as you feel through the day at night, when you're trying to fall asleep, you can't wind down or you're waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and then you can't fall asleep. That's really the biggest problem of them all. Since most of your body's natural healing and repair processes occur again when you sleep. So if your sleep isn't restorative, your body's natural repair mechanisms can't do their job. And again, you're waking up the next morning with a backlog of stuck stress. Your autonomic nervous system and the neurological regulators that manage stress repair and digestion get out of balance. And if you can't balance yourself back out to the easy zone, your gut microbiomes and immune system again are gonna get suppressed and your mental clarity and emotional health is gonna become more compromised. Now, here's a big problem. <laughs> If you do what most people do when you have these kind of symptoms or you are having these symptoms and you're starting to pop pills to alleviate your symptoms, medication can also affect your immune function and your neurological regulation. So not only does fascia support our structure and our posture, it plays a significant role in the function of our immune system. The lymphatic system is the most important part of your immune function and overall health. And as it turns out, there is no separation between fascia and lymph either. So this fluid flow also helps with the absorption and transportation of free fatty acids from the digestive system. So it also plays a role in the gut microbiomes and the metabolic system. And at the 2018 Fascia Congress, researchers like Dr. Peter Friedel and Neil Tees defined the pre-lymphatic channels or interstitium as the conduit between fascia and lymph. And these interstitial pa uh, spaces are what are pulling excess fluid and waste from the extracellular matrix into the lymphatic system. And ultimately, that's how we eliminate the junk out of our bodies, doing things like breathing, sweating, or going to the bathroom. And What's been compelling since 2018 is these preliminary research findings further validate the importance of fluid flow dynamics. So fascial hydration is a critical element in our immune processes. So I'm gonna be bold and say that fascia is one intuitive, huge endocrine lymphoidal system and our fascia is playing a role in our, in our immune processes. Now, with more research directed to the importance of the interstitial spaces and the fluid flow within those spaces, we're really gaining new insight on connective tissue function, elasticity, cancer metastasis, fibrosis, and of course the implications of self-care and hands-on therapeutic treatments. So just remember, from posture to cellular health, fascial dysfunction can lead to chronic inflammation, altered neurological responsiveness, and it can hinder our overall neurological stability. And really, I have so much more to say about the lymphatic system and the role that it plays on fascia and disease, but understanding that fascia is once again the environment that all of these systems live in is really the critical role in what we're talking about. So by restoring the fluid flow in fascia through melt and body work, I'm proposing that fascia, when it's more hydrated and pliable, uh, the lymphatic flow and movement is more efficient and swelling and inflammation can go down. So while, you know, all of these components of daily living and movement are critical, we really need to learn how to address uh, fluid flow exchange and fascia. So while melt looks like foam rolling, 
in my clinical research, I have found clients who melt daily, reduce gastrointestinal distress, including constipation, bloating, and acid reflux. They improve their emotional and psychological balance. They literally just start feeling better. Just as often as they say that they reduce joint pain and improve their physical pain issues. Um, and people who start melting sleep better, which I think is a critical component of why they feel better over time. So melt is really a way to give you a simple, effective way to help yourself and your clients veer their minds away from where they feel pain and toward identifying and addressing the sneaky culprits that are causing the brain to sound the alarm. So beyond medication and surgeries and waiting for pain to get our attention, we really need to actively partake in helping our body's ability to sustain resilience and longevity, not just to live longer, but to add quality to our life today and ensure a better tomorrow. Again, we just need to become more proactive than reactive. Think about it like, you know, if your uh, sink is leaking and all you keep doing is putting a bucket under the pipe instead of just fixing the pipe, right? So we really wanna come back to a causal issue and start to tap into the system that can improve our overall function. So hopefully I've painted a good enough picture for you about what fascia is and how fascial altercations can wreak havoc on stability and every other system in your body. I'm gonna quickly simplify and overview the language of the MELT method and simplify the science into the five elements of the living body model. And then we're gonna apply the model and overview the four R's of MELT. So the living body model uh, contains five elements, the autopilot, body sense, tensional energy, masses and spaces, and the neural core. When I started sharing melt with the world, uh, I was bringing in strips of cow fascia into a group environment after sharing it with my clients and getting them to change. And it just didn't make any sense to anybody. So as I started to infuse the science into a simplified language, it helped people understand how a living human body sustains stability and what was missing in their daily life. So learning to melt is kind of like learning a new language. So the more you understand the language, the easier it is for you to melt. So the autopilot is the simplified way to say neurofascial system. It's defining the parts of your body that support, protect, and stabilize you without your voluntary control or conscious awareness. And it's a term that we use and you can learn how to use body sense to evaluate how your autopilot is functioning. Is it efficient or not? And body sense is actually a term, a simplified term for sensory reception, proprioception and interoreception. So think of body sense like a built-in internal awareness meter that actually your autopilot uses to sense your body's position without using your common senses of sight, touch, taste, sound, or hearing. Your body is using like GPS, body sense like sonar, to identify where your joints are to keep you upright and balanced. Now the third is a very simple anatomical term uh, called masses and spaces. It, simpl it simplifies anatomical language and this is a structural assessment tool to help you improve your own body awareness and to identify common imbalances using body sense uh, so that you can identify issues in your tension and compression management before they cause autopilot inefficiency but also using the masses and spaces term you can identify if your autopilot is functioning efficiently or not. Uh, the fourth element is called tensional energy. This term simplifies biotensegrity, mechanotransduction, and piezoelectricity. Uh, we already know biotensegrity is defining this continuous tension network. The mechanotransduction is taking mechanical force, tension, or compression and turning it into cellular exchange. And piezoelectricity is a component of collagen. If you pull or compress on your body in particular ways and hold that tension and then let it go, it creates a body-wide signaling through the collagen matrix, and they define that as piezoelectricity. It is actually like a charge that goes through the system to create body-wide communication communication on a cellular level. And simply, tensional energy just defines how a fluid system creates a supportive elastic environment that allows for body-wide communication. I'm basically referring to how interstitial fluid flow goes from fascia to lymph using that term without saying any of those things. And then finally, a very technical term is called the neural core. 
It simplifies all of the neurological reflexes and mechanisms that are working together to keep you stable and upright while protecting your spines and vital organs in an autonomic way. So your autopilot uses this neuromyofascial channel uh, to stabilize your body. And we can learn how to access that neuro core through subtle body techniques that relate to the breath and something we call the reflexive and rooting mechanisms of the body. And you learn all about this in the online training. So we take that language and we apply it to the four R's protocol, which is basically just applying the living body model to your self-care practice. And we do that when we talk about the four R's of melt, reconnect, rebalance, rehydrate, and release. So what we do in melt is we use soft tools. We have uh, soft balls and, for the hands and feet, and we always begin with a large soft ball. In fact, you could just use that one ball and, and always just use that only. We also use soft tools like the soft body roller and the half roller so people with scoliosis can be on a on a, a more flat surface especially people with sacroiliac issues under the pelvis and then we have assessment techniques with the hands we do a multiple amount of hand techniques uh, assessment techniques before you treat your feet and of course the rest assess to evaluate using body sense your masses and spaces to identify where stuck stress is living in your body and to see if you can key into the common imbalances that many people possess that are left unaddressed from day to day before you start melting Rebalancing techniques access the neural core reflexes and mechanisms to help the autopilot reacquire its connection to our center of gravity and also improve the neural core efficiency. So working with the breath in very specific ways like you're seeing here, the 3D breath breakdown or the 3D breath actually activating the core reflex so that we can tune into some of these autonomic functions and improve the efficiency of them. And then we always come back down for a reassess after many of the sequences so that we can really value the changes and see if the autopilot resets. The third R of melt is rehydrate and there's compression and lengthening techniques. The compression techniques used on the hands, feet, and on the body are called gliding, shearing, and rinsing. And these are ways to gliding as a way to prepare connective tissue uh, and also explore your body for accumulative stress. Shearing is a way to stimulate the cells of fascia and create that ignition through piezoelectricity through the collagen matrix. Rinsing is a global fluid exchange, creating a vortex-like movement in the fluid of fascia so that we create this body-wide exchange even doing local compression techniques. So whether you're using the balls or the rollers, we can treat different regions of the body and make these effects. Then we also have lengthening techniques like rib length or double arm reach, single arm reach. These are ways to create fascial tension across myofascial meridians. And we also know very similar to compression techniques, if you cause tension to fascia in localized ways in a very organized manner and let it go, again, you can get that, that global fluid exchange, that piezoelectric charge through the full fascial matrix, and actually, again, begin to adapt your nervous system into a new state of balance. It's very profound to help your autopilot reclaim its connection to the joints of the body. And then the fourth R of melt is release. We have a neck release technique, a low back release technique, a sternal decompression, as well as decompression techniques like position point pressing on the hands and feet. And these are ways to, again, help the nervous system reacquire connection toward our primary spaces of the body to reset that neuromyofascial channel. And then, of course, after you melt, it doesn't matter how good you get at melting, we always assess and reassess at the end so that we can consciously value the changes, but to also give our autopilot time to adapt to the new placement of the body's alignment. So one of the proposals we always make with melt is why wait for pain and injuries to help your body function more efficiently? Because look, if you don't spend time preparing and restoring the neurofascial components of stability, at some point you're going to spend a lot more time and money repairing your body after you have a problem or recovering from an injury. So my proposal using melt is it's a, just a proactive way to shift people from being reactive to pain. We really just do things after we have a problem. We need 
need to become proactive and realize that we can actually boost our stability. And as we improve our stability, our efficiency of mobility always improves. You can't be efficiently mobile if you're inefficiently stable. So MELT is really about recharging our stability components so that we live a better life. Self-care is truly the best health care. So I hope that that lecture intrigues you to wanting to learn more uh, about the neurofascial system and really dive a little more deeply into this incredible research that's out there now. And as a founding member of the Fascial Research Society and somebody who has dedicated 20 years of her life to trying to educate the general public and professionals about how important fascia is. I hope that this piques your interest to learn more. And of course, to find out more about the MELT method and become an instructor, we have a wonderful community of like-minded individuals, and there's just so much more that I can share with you through the online trainings. So I'm going to hand this back to all of you guys uh, to find out more. And again, thanks so much for being part of our our online course today. I hope that you got a little bit out of that. Uh, make sure three tips for you. Sip water frequently, eat water-filled foods, and do me a favor. Go tell one person today how much you love them and how much you appreciate them because if you put a little bit of positive energy out into the world, it comes back to all of us. So I appreciate that. Happy melting. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. So um, what I'd love to do now, Sue, is open it up for any questions that uh, our, our attendees have. If you're ready. I'm ready, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry that the sound, hopefully you guys can hear me now. I'm sorry that that sound will, will, will make sure that we increase that for the recording so that you guys can hear me. I saw somebody says, she talks fast. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're all used to it. <laughs> all right, Sue, so I'm just gonna start firing away. So okay. the first question that came in, I think they're specifically asking if there's a certification course for hand and foot. You know, there, there used to be, and we're actually looking at maybe launching that in 2022 again. But what we did was because a lot of people who wanted to embody melt, they, they were like, we wanted to get right to the roller. And I'm so happy that somebody is actually asking about the hand and foot because it really is the foundation of the methodology is, is, you know, if you're not melting your hands and feet, you're not doing the method. So it's important that you understand how to tap into the neurofascial system in that indirect way. And it just makes the most profound changes. So we incorporated it into the level one. So you're basically getting two instructor trainings in, in one price so that it was actually less expensive. We put it all into uh, the training so that you would learn the hand and foot and then apply those techniques to the body. Yeah, and I love how you say hand and foot could just be a modality all on its own. Um, when I first started, my low back pain started to go away just by melting my feet. And I, I tell people that story all the time. I'm like, for real, for real, with this little ball, are you kidding me? Yeah, one of our one of our uh, instructors, Julianne, just sent me a picture of a gal who uh, had, you know, after pregnancy, her ankles keep swelling up. And she said, you know, you should just start doing the hands and feet. And so she has a before and after picture of like a huge swelled up ankle and then this reduced ankle. It is really powerful. I mean, you're if you have back pain, the best place to start are your feet. You have neck pain. Treat your hands. It is pretty profound. So it's uh, kind of amazing. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Our next question is from Tom. Now we get this question all the time. So Tom is six foot three inches tall. And he mm -hmm. said when putting the roller under his back, he tends to either fall off with his head or fall off with the end of his spine. Is there a longer roller available? It's not a longer roller, but you know what we have, hang on, I'll get it, is uh, there, there's two things. Number one, you know, as long as the center of the back of your head is on the roller, aim for getting this part of your head. If the top part of your head isn't on the roller, it doesn't matter because it's not on the roller anyway, right? It's the center of the back of your head has to be on the roller. So, I mean, I have a seven foot four client and he can fit on the roller, but the way that I do it is I take the performance roller and I either add it to the roller or I put his head on this and his body on the roller or we've even played around with putting his 
body on the roller and we put the, the pelvis this way so that his pelvis is on the roller and his spine is on the full length. So we make it like a T-shaped and it works just as well. That would be my recommendation. Yes, yes. All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, somebody's asking, do you have a training focused on those of us that are 50 plus? A and training? No, I mean, actually, that's just it is that melt is for everybody. It doesn't matter. I mean, I'm over 50. I am sorry to say. Um, <laughs> disappointing. Uh, but but really, um, the beauty of melt is that it meets everybody where they're at. And that's the nice thing. The, the methodology is actually pretty vast. There's five levels of instructor training. And I have, if you're just a general person, you know, looking to create self-care, Melt On Demand is the streaming platform that we have. And, you know, I would just recommend going there and just start working through the Melt fundamentals and then into Melt performance and work your way into the methodology. But, um, you know, I mean, I have 90 year olds, I have 14 year olds, I have an eight-year-old who melts. So it really is just about, we. it doesn't matter what a pain problem is or what your age is. We always start everybody doing a mini hand treatment and a mini foot treatment and rebalance. 100%, that's where we are. And if we have somebody who has scoliosis or um, uh, prolapse or, or uh, uh, SI joint dysfunction, something where something along the spine is really uh, having trouble, we have the flat roller, the, the half roller, and we put the flat side up on the body. But I mean, I've, I've gotten people who melt at any age. It's, it's for everybody. It is for everybody, everybody, every age. Yes, I love that. Uh, one of our instructors just said, I have a 93 year old that I get on that roller all the time. So yes, it can happen. Um, let's see, you know what? I've, I have gotten asked this question before. I love this. Do you think our ancestors, or why do you think our ancestors did not need to melt? I don't know, maybe we're talking about cavemen and whatever. If so, why? And then why is it needed for us modern humans? Well, I mean, that what a great question because our ancestors were squatting to pee and shit, excuse my French. Um, they were eating foods that had less chemicals and junk in it. And they didn't have the electronics and all the EMF waves and everything else. And they weren't sitting in front of a computer screen all the time and doing so much sedentary things. So the, the reality of it is our modern day lifestyles have, you know, and, and technology have expanded, but our bodies have not caught up to it. And that's why we need now more than ever. And remember that slide about the, the easy zone, right? Is that we're really inundated with so much stress all of the time. If you're sleeping with a computer in your bedroom, you're not sleeping in a dark room, you have cats and dogs that are disrupting your sleep. If you wake up the next day with a backlog of stack stress and after a while, your nervous system, the actual rest and repair has a hard time balancing out the cumulative stress. So that's really why in this modern day lifestyle, we are stressed out. Um, and even people who say, I'm not that stressed out. I'm like, you know, I beg to differ. When I talk to people who say that in 10 minutes, I'm hearing negative conversations. I'm hearing a lot of emotional chatter. Um, and a lot of people are ruminating in the past. They're not in the present moment at all, which is also going to create stuck stress in the body. Emotional trauma um, actually will cause more physical pain than a physical injury. And I'll share this, you know, when I first started in the fitness industry and I, you know, I was working with high performance athletes. And when I got injured and I had pain and none of those things work, it was pretty debilitating for me, but it wasn't until 2000 and or when 9-11 happened, when um, I had that rude awakening of post-traumatic stress disorder and people coming into my clinic who had worse pain than a person who got into a car accident. And it was more elusive and it didn't have an identifiable source and they couldn't put their finger on it, but they were in they were in pain. So our own emotions can actually trigger a historical response and cause pain today. And so, you know, the other thing about melt is it really brings you back to the present moment. When I invite people to go into their body and sense what they feel, this is really about the invitation to come back to right now and stop thinking about tomorrow or the day before or what happened to you when, and just what's your problem right now? And, and can we work on those 
those things right now. And you might find that if I ask you that question, you say, I, I don't really have a problem right now. And I'm like, stay right there where you don't have any problems. Don't go into the past where all the problems are that you can't fix because nothing happens in the past, right? So emotions can really cause a response by the nervous system to go back and actually elicit pain again and again, even though there's nothing happening. So um, MELT addresses that too. We work with people with traumatic brain injury and people with post-traumatic stress disorder and all sorts of things. Yeah, helps calm their nervous system. They're able to sleep better at night. Yeah, good stuff. All right, our next question. How do you fit melt into your day-to-day -day physical exercise routine? And I'm, I'm thinking they're not asking how Stu Hitzman does it. I think they're asking how the average person does it. I was going to say, because I wake up every morning and I, before I go out and do my meditation, I brush my teeth and I melt my feet and I feed the cats and then I go sit out on my beautiful Lanai and I do a nice meditation. Um, but my recommendation for melt is, you know, because again, MELT actually is a huge methodology. The four R's protocol are more of a restorative type of program, whereas the neuro strength part of MELT performance is more about improving stabilization in the joints that tend to get unstable, our shoulder girdle, pelvic girdle, and, and along the spine. So if you're going to do a bout of, of heavy cardiovascular exercise, you're going to be running and doing things. If you just melt for like a couple of minutes before you go, but then really restore after because you're going to lose a lot of the fluid perfusion in your joints after doing um, like high impact aerobics or running. That's, you know, like that's where the dehydration occurs. If you're going to lift weights, I often think doing some melt before you lift weights will minimize some of the compensating range of motion patterns that you have. It'll take the sensory motor control back into your hands so that you get uh, um, better mobility uh, as you train. So again, after cardio, before weight training, but really I would say just do 10 minutes in the beginning and maybe a little bit after. And, and I also, if you if you do have pain, um, I always uh, tell people if you if you are suffering with any type of chronic disorder, disease, illness of any sort, melt about an hour before you go to bed because it gives your nervous system enough time to kind of then settle back in. And I always find when I melt before I go to bed, I fall asleep faster and I stay asleep more soundly. And that really again is is how you get out of pain is get a more restful night's sleep. Yeah. And the rebalance sequence for me, I mean, it is such a subtle, awesome technique. That is the one that I usually do before bed. If I know that I'm wired or I'm stressed or I'm anxious, rebalance sequence about an hour before you go to bed, it only takes 10 minutes. You don't have to melt for hours and hours, 10 minutes, an hour before bed. It is golden. All right, our next question is, if I live internationally, can I take a MELT training? You can, I did it all online for you guys. Come to the online training. That was one of the big things for me was so many people when I would do conventions, uh, you know, like in different countries, they'd be like, I wanna come to a training, but I can't afford to come to New York City and then, you know, the hotel and the travel expense. And, you know, COVID was kind of the blessing and curse for, for so many of us. And I had all of these instructors, I mean, we have thousands of instructors already going up into the upper levels of training. So I said, let's just move it online and we'll give a world-class experience online. And I have to tell you, I actually think the online training is better because just like y'all mentioned, I talk fast. So now you can watch the videos again and you again. Can pause. You can pause. You can pause. <laughs> You know, so, um, and, and the great thing about our online trainings is we also have people like Carrie and other uh, teacher instructors. We do live calls, there is assistance. We have private Facebook pages. So we're constantly giving even more than what you pay for because we want people to go out there. My goal is to get people to help their communities. So, you know, I just, I wanna give everybody as much as I can of myself so that they will go out there and, and help people. Excellent. All right, our next question is coming in from Brenda. She's talking about trigger fingers. She wants to know specifically what she should and should not do 
with the hand treatment for trigger finger. Okay, so trigger finger is something specific, right? Because the, the tendons are actually very long that control the, the arm. So when my clients have trigger finger, the hand treatment's the last thing in your map that you're gonna do. So if you have a trigger finger, you're better off starting with a rebalance sequence and doing something like the upper body length uh, technique. So there's a, there's a rebalance and upper body length sequence on Melt On Demand, where you'd be doing moves like double arm reach or a neck turn turn, upper back hydrate, a neck decompress, and then you start to work on your hands. And it doesn't matter what your problems are, even with a trigger finger, you want to master a mini hand treatment. And once you are proficient at doing the mini hand treatment, then you add the softball hand treatment, meaning that you add position point pressing, and then you're going to add the small softball to do things like knuckle decompress and, and, and with the, um, the softball doing like forearm techniques. That's really where you'll make the change. The forearm is one of the very critical places to work on with the trigger finger, but also knuckle decompress. But just remember, don't just jump into the more advanced treatments. You want to really, I mean, hear me when I say this, guys, give your nervous system time to adapt to a new environment, but also get proficient with the basics, get the fundamentals into your body, and then drop in more and more techniques. Because look, if you have pain, like I know everybody just wants to like, you know, you're healed and it's over, right? But but we are in a constant state of change and your world gets small when you can't change. And that's what pain is, is a, is a sense that you are not changing. So our goal is to build your nervous system back to a place where it's more balanced and efficient and then boost that fluid flow so that your sensory reception is more abundant. And now you have a recipe for, to really make some lasting changes. Yeah. Excellent. And people usually, like you said, they want to be out of pain now. Yeah. Sometimes it takes years and years and years, even a lifetime to get into the condition that they're in. So it's going to take a little work to undo it. Yeah. Be patient with your body. And remember pain, remember what I said, it's like an alarm going off, right? And most often I'll bet that if you've had pain problems, you've gone over to the alarm and taken the batteries out instead of really trying to figure out what it is. And here's another bad news is oftentimes you go to a doctor, you have a trigger finger, you know what they're going to want to do. They're going to want to cut the tendon. Wait a minute. You know, like, hang on, isn't there anything else I can do? And a doctor will actually tell you no, but remember a doctor is saying, I don't have anything else for you. But that doesn't mean that there isn't anything else for you. So it is our job to really listen to the signals of the body and catch those pre-pain signals. It's really important when you guys start melting, don't skip the assess and the reassess. When you assess, if you identify those four common imbalances that many of us possess that are left unaddressed from day to day, I'm telling you, in all of the years and the thousands and thousands of people I've had my hands on, people in chronic pain usually have all four and autopilot inefficiency. And you want to pick that up because if you can stop those and change that, it starts to create a new conversation for your nervous system. Your autopilot goes back into more down regulation. That's where repair can then happen. Yeah. Well said. Thanks. Next question. Do I have to take all five levels of the melt training to begin teaching melt? No. The great news about the training is once you are a level one instructor training after the, and, and we give 90 days, it's a 90 day course to, because again, we want to build you up into the basics and then work you into the sequences. Once you have the level one under your belt, you start teaching intro classes, you can make a variety of workshops, there's all sorts of printouts, there's downloads, there's video tutorials, tons of stuff so that you can go out and teach an exceptional class. And then the great thing is when you get, if you decide to go to level two and add more, in as you're going through the training, you can start to incorporate those right into your classes as you're learning. That's how that's the beauty of it. So it's like a constant back and forth where you're just adding and putting more layers on your cake. It's great. I mean, there's you you get right out there teaching in 90 days. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Oh, I lost my question. Um, this is about how successful is melt with arthritis? Amazing. I mean, actually, that was what, what is arthritis? Anything that has an ITIS is inflammation. Arthritis is inflammation of joints. So there's osteoarthritis, right? There's rheumatoid arthritis. But in general, arth arthritic conditions can be radically helped by tapping into fascia. 
Fascia is the system that is getting inflamed and causing you inflammation in your joints. There's no, there's no muscles around your joints. It's all fascia. So what we want to do is start to rehydrate that tissue. And here's the secret with arthritis. It's a daily thing. And your best bet is doing this, going to like, and, and I saw somebody ask like, hey, I have a problem. Where do I start on melt? Everybody that goes to melt, I'm going to recommend that you go to the hand and foot fundamental collection and learn how to do the softball hand and foot treatments and start there. That's the place to learn. And then go to the melt fundamentals there. You're going to learn the rebalance sequence, the upper and lower body compression and length sequences, the neck and low back release sequence. Just learn the seven fundamental sequences. Does not matter what the pain problem is, but what you will learn there is, hey, if you have upper body pain, start with the lower body techniques. If you have lower body pain, start with the upper body. That's called the indirect before direct approach. We don't go right after the areas that we have pain. We want to try to support and bring more fluid perfusion to those areas. And then we start to address those directly. So start there, go to the fundamental collections on melt on demand. Mm -hmm. So we might have room for one more question. It's about one minute of five. So let's do this one. Um, is melt helpful for people who have increased connective tissue extensibility? Um, she's probably talking about Ehlers or, you know, yeah, like exactly. really flexible. Yeah, this is, this is actually, I think the coolest thing about the discovery for me about connective tissue is that connective tissue, there's something called stiffness and elasticity. Stiffness is fascia's ability to resist distortion when stress is applied. The elastic property isn't about how much fascia moves and adapts, that's just what it's constantly doing, but it's about how quickly it returns. So if you have a mixed connective tissue disorder like Ehlers-Danlos or um, uh, uh, scleroderma where you're super stiff, like it doesn't no matter which side of the spectrum you're on, as you start to hydrate fascia, you improve the tone, the stiff to elastic balance of fascia. And then once you have that stability in the fluid flow, you've moved that. If you have an, if you have one of these mixed connective tissue, Marfan syndrome, Ehlers, where you're hyper elastic, you, you tend to be more hyper flexible. You guys are the ones that should go to the um, melt performance fundamental collection and start reestablishing joint stabilization. It's a sensory motor issue that is also existing with Ehlers. It's not just the fascia. The, the sensory motor feedback is low in tone. It's a constant. So what we want to do is reestablish some of that neuro strength to the nervous system, get the sensory motor control back on track. So once you learn the fundamentals, your job is to now get the neuro strength back on track. And, and that's, that's just a, a simple principle uh, for anybody who's hypermobile. Yeah. All right, Sue, thank you so much for answering everyone's questions. We have so many other questions that have rolled in, but we're yeah. at Maybe, hey, maybe maybe what we'll maybe what we'll do, Carrie, is if, if I can get these questions, maybe I'll do a QA on uh, Instagram for you guys and keep the conversation going because you guys are asking a ton of questions and I'd love to be able to answer them. Yeah, absolutely. So right now we have representatives standing by on meltmethod.com to answer whatever questions you have. Remember, we have a level one training starting in September. It's uh, September 21st is our launch date please sign up before September 21st um, so we can get you your products and, and you can start melting. It's a three month training. It's awesome. You have so much support uh, for that. This webinar is recorded. We're gonna send you all a recording or a copy of the recording in the next few days. And like I said, we're gonna reach out to all of you who have had questions and we're gonna answer your questions via email. Awesome. Wonderful to have all of you guys on. I hope that this gets you excited about learning more about your body and what it takes to lead a more active, healthy life. And just like Carrie said, I hope that you'll join us for the instructor training. It is so much fun and you'll be with so many like-minded people. It's such an incredible community. So big shout out to, I see all that some of you guys are instructors. So big shout out to our instructors. I love you guys. So thanks so much for being part of the call. <laughs>